Okay. All right, so today is Easter Sunday, 2022. And this is the day each year that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you think about it, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most significant event in the history of the Christian faith. It's so foundational to our faith that the Bible has some strong things to say about the ramifications if Christ did not rise from the dead. Having a discussion about whether or not Jesus rose from the dead assumes something. And what is that? It assumes that Jesus actually existed and lived on this earth. I don't know of anyone personally or have found, have found them online or run into them uh, that's educated that denies that Jesus Christ existed. Historians concur that the evidence is overwhelming that Jesus did exist, that he was a man who walked on this earth. I had to come up with a term for people who deny the historical Jesus, and I couldn't come up with anything other than internet clowns. So internet clowns deny that Jesus existed. What's funny is that the, <clears throat> the same people that deny the historical Jesus, they believe that many people existed in the past, people they've never seen with their own eyes, people <clears throat> they probably don't even know what evidence exists that those people did exist, and why do they believe it? Well, they believe it because they were taught by their parents or maybe their teachers that these men existed in the past, or they believe it because they read it in a book. So what's more interesting is that these people who mock Christians for believing in Jesus simply because we were told by teachers and parents, or they mock us for believing Jesus existed because we read it in a book referring to the Bible. So they don't see the contradiction. But these people believe that Alexander the Great existed. These people believe that Hannibal existed. They even believe that George Washington existed. And it's the same evidence that shows that these men existed that we have for Jesus' existence. And the same book that they mock, the Bible, does something incredibly fascinating. The Bible actually says what would make our faith false. The Bible openly admits what it is that would falsify our faith. When was the last time that you were in a conversation with someone and they openly and readily admitted what would make their position wrong. It's like pulling teeth to get people to admit what evidence would refute their position. But that's exactly what the Bible does. As Christians, we shouldn't shy away from telling people exactly what would make us wrong, what would disprove our faith and our beliefs. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is an incredible chapter in the Bible. It contains a crystal clear gospel message, but then it goes on to explain exactly what it would mean if we are wrong. Starting with verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says this, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, 
which also you received and in which you stand, by which you are also saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So Paul right here is about to state the gospel which he preached to them already, and more importantly, by which we are saved. Verse 3 continues, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So Christ died for our sins, was buried, and most importantly, rose again the third day. This is the good news. This is the gospel by which we are saved. And we don't have to merely believe this by blind faith. There were eyewitnesses to this miraculous event. Starting in verse 5, we learn of all the people who saw Christ with their own eyes after he rose from the dead. Verse 5, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. That's referring to some of the witnesses by the time Paul is writing this have died. Verse 7, after that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. Now, why is this important? It's because eyewitness accounts are some of the most important pieces of evidence that we have to prove anything, anything at all. If someone witnesses a crime being committed, that's considered the best evidence. Think about it. If you find a broken window and then you find a baseball on the living room floor, you pretty much know what happened, but what do you not know? You, you don't know who did it. Now, what if an eyewitness comes along and says, I saw who threw the baseball. It was so-and-so. The case is solved. These men throughout history that we all believe in, I just chose random examples, which were Alexander the Great, Hannibal, and George Washington. These were all men who existed, and there were men who existed with them, known as contemporaries, and they wrote about these men. These contemporaneous witnesses serve as incredibly strong evidence that the men themselves existed. This is no different with Jesus. He was seen by hundreds of men after he died and rose from the dead. And some of these men wrote about their experience with him both before his death and after his resurrection. So let's continue with verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 15. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. So what he's saying here is that if someone makes just a general claim that no one rises from the dead, well, then that means Jesus did not rise from the dead. And so what does Paul do with this? He probably just ignores it, right? No, he doesn't do that. He's not scared of this claim. He doesn't ignore it because he actually believes in the resurrection. He doesn't sweep it under the rug. He owns it. He completely owns it, and he says what it would mean to our faith if Jesus did not rise from the dead. Verse 14 says, And if Christ is not risen, 
then our preaching is empty and, our, and your faith is also empty. Wow. If Christ did not rise from the dead, then our preaching is empty and our faith is also empty. And just think about how true that is. If Christ, who walked on the earth and died on a cross, stayed dead, then all of this that we're doing is worthless, and with it, our faith. But Paul's not done. Verse 15 continues. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if, in fact, the dead do not rise. So if Christ did not rise from the dead, we are also false witnesses of God himself because we claim that it was God who raised Christ from the dead. And if Paul was not clear enough yet, he repeats it one more time in verse 16. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Your faith is futile. That's a very strong word. Futile means pointless. It means incapable of being useful. And he's right. If Christ is not risen, our faith is pointless, and we are not forgiven. Now, this has eternal ramifications as well. It doesn't just affect life in the here and now, but this also would affect the afterlife. Verse 18 says, then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. This means that, that if there is no resurrection, the people who died have simply perished they are no more. They no longer exist. Forever gone. Paul concludes his open and honest discussion about what it would mean if Christ did not rise from the dead in verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. What does this mean? He's saying that if Christ only gives us hope in this life, the life we are living now, then that is not really worth that much. True hope is that there is life after life on earth, and that is what we can look forward to if and only if Christ rose from the dead. So these eyewitnesses who saw Jesus and were with him after he rose from the dead, what happened in their lives? What transpired? You see, people are going to claim, skeptics are going to claim, that these eyewitnesses were lying about seeing the risen Christ. Now, I'm going to ignore this for a second. <laughs> But anyone can claim that any eyewitness is lying, right? That's just a claim. Imagine if they told us that they believe George Washington existed because there were eyewitnesses who lived with him, saw him, and wrote about him, and we just said, oh, they were lying. We'd never do that, of course, but they love to do that. That's the exact same argument that they are using against us. So if these people were lying, what would their lives have looked like after Jesus died? If you really truly did not see Jesus resurrected and alive again after being crucified, what would you do with the rest of your life? Would you obey Christ's command to go out into all the world and preach the gospel? Think about that. That's a thankless job that pays practically nothing. 
But that's exactly what these men did. Andrew was one of the apostles. The apostles were a part of Jesus' inner circle of 12 men. He spent the rest of his life preaching the gospel, preaching the good news that Jesus both died and rose from the dead. Why do this? Why spend the rest of your life spreading a lie? It just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Now, I could see pride getting in the way at first, right? At first, you want to save face, but spending the rest of your life? I don't know. The historian Eusebius, he wrote that Andrew may have actually brought the gospel all the way to modern-day Ukraine. That's how committed he was. Now, what if you ended up in a situation where someone said they would kill you unless you denied that you saw Christ risen from the dead? What would you do? I know what I would do. <laughs> I would confess to lying immediately. No question. The more I dwell on this, I would probably confess to lying about something that I was actually telling the truth about to save myself. I don't know if I would have the strength in the moment to admit something knowing that admitting to it would get me killed. But this is exactly what happened with the men who witnessed with their own eyes the resurrected Jesus. Andrew was killed by crucifixion in Greece, and he was crucified in an X shape as opposed to a traditional T, as it's claimed he considered himself unworthy to be crucified in the exact same manner as Christ. By the way, the X-shaped cross, if you Google this, it's now known as the St. Andrew's cross. Peter, Andrew's brother, also part of Christ's 12 apostles, he continued to take the gospel to the world after Christ's death, and he ended up crucified. That was under Nero's reign. And he was crucified upside down by choice. The historian Jerome wrote this. At Nero's hands, Peter received the crown of martyrdom, being nailed to the cross with his head towards the ground and his feet raised on high, asserting that he was unworthy to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord. Peter of Alexandria had this to say. Peter, the first of the apostles, having been often apprehended and thrown into prison and treated with ignominy, was last of all crucified at Rome. Origen said this about Peter. Peter was crucified at Rome with his head downwards as he himself had desired to suffer. And Tertullian said that Peter endures a passion like his Lord's, and the budding faith Nero first made bloody in Rome. There Peter was girded by another since he was bound to the cross. These men and others gave their lives for what they saw and for what they experienced. They couldn't deny what clearly had happened. And so here we are, we find ourselves 2,000 years later, we're still talking about these men. We're still talking about their lives. We're still talking about how they died. And more importantly, we are still here talking about and celebrating the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Christ did not rise from the dead, our faith is in vain. That much is true. But the evidence is overwhelming. And today, millions of Christians, Christ followers all over the world, remember and celebrate the foundation of our faith. He is risen.